house. This is Family Enrichment Wednesday. Somebody say Family Enrichment. This is Family Enrichment Wednesday, and one of the things that we like to do is to be able to to specify certain topics that we can uh, speak to concerning our families, concerning our relationships. Now, you could be married or you could be single. It doesn't matter because the information, the information is very important and pertinent to whatever relationship that you may have. And so I thought it would be apropos uh, to bring to you today some specialist. Yeah, yeah, some specialist. Uh, we have been we have been uh, uh, working with with the Pinowitz uh, for a year now, and uh, and they have been a blessing to us in our in our lives um, and to our marriage and to our children's life. They've been a blessing because once once we sat in their office and heard uh, probably some of the information that many of you are going to hear, it changed the way that we perceived each other. Real talk, real talk. I stopped trying to make her, make First Lady into something that I think I wanted. And she tried, she stopped trying to make me into something that she thought she wanted. And we started to understand how each other think and how we respond to certain situations. So we understand each other better. It's even changed the way that I parent. It's even changed the way that we parent. And I, I wanted to bring some specialists to you that is going to help us just the same way that they, that they helped us in our marriage. And so Dr. W.H. Pinowit was raised as a Roman Catholic. He accepted Jesus at 18 years old. He was a charter member of the Palos Verde uh, Faith Center in Palos Verde, uh, California, under Dr. Ed Dufresne. Did I get that right? Boom. In the mid-1970s, it was there that Dr. Pinowit learned that nothing is impossible with Jesus. Dr. Pinowit is a professional clinical member with the National Christian Counselors Association and a board-certified temperament counselor. He holds a THB, a THM, a Masters of Divinity, a, Ma a D-Men. That's, a, that's a, a, a Bachelor's of Theology. Yes, yeah, THB, uh, 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 Masters of Theology, a Masters of Divinity, and a, and a D-Man, a uh, Doctorate of Ministry. And he has achieve, achieved diplomat status with the National Board of Christian Clinical Therapists and is a board-certified clinical supervisor, training therapists in counseling disciplines. Dr. Pinowitz specializes in marriage and family therapy, children. Anybody got children in here? Mm -hmm. And teens. Somebody say teens. I heard somebody say that if you got teens as children in your house, maybe you should be classified like, like you got a sickness. Like, how you doing, child? I got teens. <laughs> ah, that was so funny when I heard it. You may not think so, but I thought it was. And you got to have teens in order for you to understand that and, and teens as well as individual therapy and so and so and so he is very qualified his lovely wife reverend linda pinowit was born and raised in a minister's family where her parents were missionaries in the united states she grew up under her father the late reverend neil alexander and her mother esther learning the true meaning of the word servitude Reverend Pinowit is licensed through SACC, Sarasota Academy of Christian Counselor, Counseling. She is a top expert marriage and family therapist in the Fort Worth, Texas area, teaching married couples and families how to communicate and how to reclaim the intimacy within marriage and family. The Pinowitz are the founders of the Pinowitz Center for Counseling and Education located in Fort Worth, Texas, and their life goal is to assist God in putting people and relationships back together again. Can we stand on our feet and give a warm part of South Fort Worth welcome to Dr. and Reverend Linda, or, or I'm sorry, W.H. and Linda Pinowitz. Come on, let's praise God for them as they come.
thank you very much. Pastor Winfield, First Lady Veronica Winfield, it is such a pleasure and an honor to be here. Just want you to know that when we walked through the door into the sanctuary, we ran right into the wall of the Holy Ghost. You guys have some good music here. That, that Praise God for that. You got your mic? Okay. This is my wife, Linda. We've been married for 32 years. And uh, from the day we met, it was on. And it has not slowed down since. And when you say, you know, how you doing? Well, I got kids. I got news for you. And when they get older, doesn't get any easier. <laughs> Two of my children are prayer ministers, are actually prayer leads at Kenneth Copeland Ministries. Um, and so um, they're still calling us, asking us questions, and, you know, we're helping them out. And they help us out. I mean, you raise your kids up in the way which they should go. They'll get a hold of you, and they'll pray for you, and sometimes they got a word of correction for you. <laughs> Praise God. So what we do is we practice temperament therapy. Yes, we do. Temperament therapy, temperament is, I call it, we call it spiritual genetics. And what, what it is is, if we do a temperament profile, well, it, we can liken a temperament profile to a physical profile. If I were to get a pencil and paper and write down so that somebody would recognize you, I would say, you know, male, female, height, weight, skin color, hair color, eye color. Why? Well, in God's infinite wisdom, he decided that you all need to be what you are. And so we are here to say, because we know personally through experience after working with thousands of people, that you are just the way God wants you to be. And don't ever let the devil or anybody else tell you differently. And what people find out, Linda, when they come to see us is people aren't as far off as they thought they were. People think that they're broken. They really, and that's just a lie of the devil. It really is. Not only are we schooled, but we're also word of faith people. And we've had our experiences with uh, different different things that, that we've gone through. We know who the enemy is, but we know who our father is, and we have the authority, and we exercise that authority on a Amen. very regular basis. Amen. Praise God. So what we want to do is we want to explain to the people a little bit about communication and where the first breakdown of communication happens. So if you all have your Bibles, you all have your Bibles, right? Rather it's uh, electronic or paper. And let's go to the first book of the Bible, Genesis. That's right near the front. <laughs> so let's go to Genesis chapter 2. And now before we get started, in Genesis chapter 1, it says God made man male and female. Male and female created he them, created he him. So the only way I can explain that is God made Adam male and female. Now how that happened, how that was, I really have no idea, but I know that's what the book says and I believe it. So God made men, and he said, be fruitful and multiply. So Adam didn't multiply. He wasn't fruitful. So let's go to Genesis 2, 18. Chapter 2, verse 18. Then the Lord God said, It's not good for man to be alone. I will make a helper suitable for him. Suitable for him. Now what does that mean, suitable for him? Adam had it all, but he really didn't have it all because he didn't have anybody that he could communicate with. He had God. And I mean, him and God would walk in the cool of the, in, of the day. Oh, wouldn't that be fabulous to be able to do that? Yes. We're going to be able to do that real soon. Because I mean, I know these are the last ticks on the clock, Pastor. It really is, you know. So wouldn't it have just been fabulous to just walk with God and communicate with him? But you know, there's a difference when you and I communicate than when I communicate with God. I got somebody that I can hold on to, that I can touch, that I can feel. 
And to some temperaments, that makes a lot of difference. And this, this is the temperament where that makes a lot of difference. So Me too. Praise God. So Adam looked for a mate. Adam named the animals. And if you really look at some of the, uh, the, the if, if you read the ancient Greek sages, they said the word named really means create. So God formed the animals and Adam spoke life into them. So if you want to study that out, it's really an interesting study, but Adam did that. But after all of that was done, and let's face it, guys, that's, that takes a lot of time to do something like that. So, what, so what, what happened? Adam didn't find one. Why? There was nothing that he named or created that he could communicate with. You can't communicate with a dog or a giraffe or a monkey or you can't communicate with them the way Adam longed to, to have communication. So let's go down to verse 22. We're in Genesis still. God knew what Adam needed. So he took the female out of Adam. And Eve was created, because Eve doesn't come along until, you know, later on in chapter 1, where God made male and female. That wasn't Eve. God took the rib out of Adam's side, fashioned it into a woman, and Adam knew when he took the first look at Eve, after God woke him up, he knew what, he knew he could communicate with her. Can you just imagine the, the, the first look that he had on Eve, and he was like, oh, yes, Lord, I can communicate with that. Thank you. Can, uh, be fruitful and multiply? Yes, I can, I can do that. <laughs> he had somebody that he could communicate with. And communication takes so many different forms, and that's what we want to talk about today. Because not every temperament communicates the same way. And if we don't know why our mate doesn't communicate with us the way we long for them to, we're going to think that, okay, it's something personal. She doesn't love me. He doesn't love me. And really, guys, nothing can be further from the truth. Most of the time, even when people come in very angry, they come in angry. And Linda usually gets those. But the reason why she does is because she has a very non-invasive approach to humanity. She can reach people that are so angry they're sneezing bullets. And she can talk to them, and she can just reach into them and just calm them down. I've seen her do it a hundred times or more. It's really something to watch. So God took the female out of the male. Now, there are different ways that we, we communicate, but first of all, I want to quote something from Dr. Bill Winston. How many know Dr. Bill Winston? We watch him every Sunday morning because, you know, when we're out speaking, we usually can't go to a church and really go there every Sunday. So, we always watch Dr. Bill Winston because in all the years we've been watching him, he teaches every Sunday what God has us studying. Because in the mornings we get together, we get our Bibles, we get our, our intercessory prayer seats, we intercede for people. And he always preaches and teaches on what we are studying. So he says this, he said, in a, a marriage situation, he says, the man transmits and the woman receives. And then he says, if I got to explain that to you, you got to go back to school. I, I can't help you, you know. So the man transmits, the woman receives. Sexually speaking, sure he does. The man transmits the seed, the woman received that seed. Nine months later, there's a newborn baby. But more than that, all five of the temperaments receive physical uh, forms of affection differently. And there are not only five straight temperaments, but there's thousands of variations of different blends of temperaments. And so here we go. Five temperaments receive this differently. Touch is communication. Now, the way our temperaments are, my wife and I, we touch a lot. You know, public display of affection, that doesn't bother us at all. We can, we'll be in the mall and I'll, I'll pull her to the side and I'll just put my arms around her and give her a big old kiss and, and she'll kiss me back and we, we, we don't care who's looking because it's, well, we've actually been able to minister to, to a few people that have come up and, you know, tried to ask, why are you doing that? Well, we explain why. And so, and we... And they think we're newlyweds. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, we've had fun with that. 
maybe we'll get a chance to explain that someday. But um, so touch is communication, but not every temperament receives that the same way. Talking is communication, but how we communicate, saying when is saying when. You and I are phlegmatic, saying when's in inclusion. Now we profile in three areas, inclusion, control, and affection. Now what inclusion is, is where your social orientation, basically surface relationships. So friends, business associates, who's in and out of friendships, that's social orientation, excuse me. Intellectual energy, what kind of a thinker are you? Certain temperaments, it's very vitally important to know what the temperament is because if they don't get their temperament needs met, the way they think is going to be skewed and that's going to cause, that's going to cause stress, it's going to cause tension, and nothing's going to be right. So touch is commun talking is communication. Saying when we, we talk to each other by touch, we talk to, we communicate with, with, each, each, with each other physically, we communicate with each other emotionally, we put it together. Sanguines can do that. But a melancholy, for example, cannot do it that way. So if we have a husband that's more sanguiny and a wife that's more melancholy, they have to learn each other's temperament. And it's really important to learn how God wove us to be before we were even in our mother's womb. So talking is communication. Emotionally, we communicate. Depending on how this is done is vital. Again, because we have five temperaments. But let's look at the first breakdown of, of communication here, Linda. Adam did not communicate with Eve, and she went into a situation that she wasn't prepared for. Now, how many times have, have we seen that, Pastor? The man doesn't transmit, so the wife doesn't receive, so she has to be the head of the household. She has to be the spiritual head. And bless God, a woman can be the spiritual head because that, that, that she can get that word into her just like the man can. And if, if, if it's a single single parent house, God's got your back. He'll make sure that that works. But when you're in a marriage relationship, the man is supposed to transmit and the woman is supposed to receive. And not only did God, God say it in the Old Testament, he said it in the New Testament as well. So let's go to Genesis chapter 3, one chapter over. Now the serpent was more crafty than any of the beasts of the field which the Lord God had made. And he said to the woman, indeed, has God said... You shall not eat from any tree of the garden. Now, here's where the breakdown happened. Because I know Adam didn't communicate with Eve and transmit what God told him because she said something different than what God told Adam. And how often does that happen? How often do we, as husbands and guys, sometimes we need to take it on the chin, you know. But the word of correction is good. It's good for the soul. So we, we send our wives out there. The wife, well, you know, let the wife take the kids to church. I've, I've worked an 80-hour week, and I, I'm, I'm just too tired. Well, you know, that means something in a family. The kids see that. The wives see that. So there's that breakdown of transmit and receive. However you got to do it, do it. Transmit to your wife. And I'm going to explain that in just a little bit as we go through temperament. So, indeed, as God said, you shall not eat from, from any tree of the garden. The woman said to the serpent, from the fruit of the trees of the garden we may eat, but from the fruit of the tree which is in the middle of the garden, God said, you shall not eat from it or touch it or you will die. But you see, God didn't say that. God didn't, God would, didn't completely say that. He said from any of the tree that he told Adam before Eve came along, from any of the trees of the garden you may eat freely, but from the tree of the knowledge of good and evil you shall not eat, for in the day that you eat it you will die. He didn't say you couldn't touch it. He, he told Adam and, and, and Eve, tend the garden. Well, to tend trees, you, you have to touch him, you know. But Eve didn't know that. So Eve went into a situation she didn't know anything about. And because of that, Eve didn't have a chance to become what God had intended her to be. But you know what, guys? Thank you, Jesus. After Jesus said it is finished woman can be exactly what God meant her to be. Praise God. Because I got to tell you, when we were kids and I thought I knew it all, 
I thought I knew it all. Yes, he did. I did. <laughs> so many times I'd say, here's what we're going to do. I'm going to do this. I'm, I'm, I'm going to do that, you know. And Linda would say, I don't know, Doc. That, that, I just don't, that person is just, there's something about them. We, we better not. And I'd just crash into the wall. And you know what? I did it so many times over the years that eventually I said, Father, maybe I need to start listening to my wife more. And he, yeah, I think you should too. <laughs> I've been speaking through her to you. <laughs> One time she said, I said, what was it I said? Uh, you know, it's, it's good to hear the voice of the Lord. And you said, tell him what you said. It's my voice you're hearing. He said, sometimes the Lord sounds like me when he talks. <laughs> <laughs> and I went, yes, ma'am. So if we hit a fork in the road and I want to go right and she wants to go left, I don't instantly assume because I'm the man and I know better than she does because a lot of times I don't know better than she does. So if we hit that fork in the road, we don't go any further because one of us isn't listening. And until we know which one isn't and which way to go, we don't go. You can always move ahead, but moving backwards isn't something you can do on God's timeline. So we want to make sure we know exactly which one is right. And it's not a contest of no. who's right and who's wrong. You know, no. we can uh, want to, you know, it's, it's human that wants to be always right. But, you know, sometimes we're not right. And so it's, it's good to be able to back off and allow the Lord to speak through through both of us, you know, what we'll do is we'll step back and we'll say, okay, we're not hearing. So we both step back and we individually pray and then we will come back together again. And the Lord has spoken to, to both of us and let us know what the, the right way is to go. And if, if we can insert something here, different temperaments have different gifts. My temperament in my control area, I am a compulsive choleric. We'll explain, if we get some, some time, we will explain that. My wife, on the other hand, is a straight supine. I initiate and respond to people much differently than she does. I'm on one end of the scale, she's way on the other end of the scale. But there are times when, and I've had to learn this, there are times when I need to hand the steering wheel over to the wife and let her drive for a while. Because we hit a situation where her gifting tell you a little quick story we had um, I had a patient he was 13 years old he was like 5 foot 10 5 foot 11 he was like about 180 pounds they called him Bubba Bubba was a big boy and he for his first session he was not gonna come in to that office he wasn't gonna come in and his dad said you know Bubba's ain't gonna come in I and he's a big boy I don't think I can get him to come in so I went down and I looked for him and I couldn't find him so Linda said, honey, let me go out and try to find him. And after enough experience, I know when she's in her zone. And I said, okay. Five minutes later, she came up with Bubba with a smile on his face. And he sat right down and just cooperated. She used her special gifting, the gifting that I don't have, to make sure that that happened. So everybody has a gift. So when she says we're not in competition, we're not. We're a team. And that's how we get further. That's how we get down the road. And if I treat her the way the Bible, especially Paul, tells me to treat her, my prayers aren't going to be hindered. And that, but that's a whole other story. And if I allow him to use his giftings, then the whole situation just turns around. Uh, many times, you know, uh, when we were younger, <laughs> first married, he'd say, I'm the leader, let me lead. And this is even before we even knew what temperament was all about. And, you know, at first, you know, I grew up in ministry. I knew all there was to know about ministry, you see. And he hadn't. Nope. So, <laughs> so, you know, when it came to ministry, I was like, eh, you know. But I really realized that he is a leader. God created him to be a leader, and I was to be the one to step back and allow him to lead. So ladies, let's allow our husbands to use their giftings that God has given them. And along with that, that puts pressure on the man. But it's really not all that difficult 
Because the word has already been performed. When Jesus said it's finished, the word's already been performed. All we have to do is speak it, believe it, and then God's grace comes along and makes it happen. Amen? So let's turn to Ephesians chapter 5 and go down to verse 22. Let me know when you get there. Okay. Wives, be subject to your own husbands as to the Lord, for the husband is head of the wife, as Christ is also head of the church. He himself being the Savior of the body. Now as to the, but as the church is subject to Christ, so also the wives ought to be subject to their husbands and everything. Now I want to stop right there and say, the church is subject to Christ. How many times when you've subjected yourself to Jesus, did he ever make you feel bad? Did he ever make you feel like you're a failure? Did he ever make you feel like, you know, he didn't want to hear you? Never. God accepts us and loves us. How many of you have been corrected by God since you've been a Christian? Now, how many of you have, how many times when God has corrected you, has he ever made you feel bad or like a failure? God, Pastor, God knows how to correct us without making us feel bad. And I would love to figure out how he does that because that would put us on the map if we could figure that out. But we're getting there. We really are. No condemnation. That's it. That's exactly what it is. And just total acceptance and love. Because we don't wrestle flesh and blood. Right. And once we realize that, we realize who the enemy is, then we're really on the right track. So, 25. Husbands, love your wives as Christ also loved the church and gave himself up for her. What did Christ do for the church? Whatever was necessary. So whatever is necessary for the husband to do for the wife, that's what he needs to do. And you and I were just talking about that, and you were saying to the women what kind of man that they need to look for if they're single. Look for one that is going to love the Lord, his God, with all his might, with all his soul. It's important that, that, that you look for a man that's willing to, to listen to the Lord and be led by him. So, verse 26, so that he might, now this is what we do, and every patient that we have, my wife and I, we both tell the man the same thing, having, so that he might sanctify her, sanctify means to, to set apart, so that he might sanctify her, having cleansed her, that's a key word, gentlemen, cleansed her by the washing of water of the word. So what that means is this, I have never met a, a woman, a married woman, and, and sometimes they come in so mad, they're, they're sneezing bullets, I mean, they're so mad, you know, and their respiration is up and their, 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 their face is red, you know, they're, they're mad, you know. And I suggested to the husband, have you been reading the Bible to your wife out loud? And he looks like the deer in the headlights, you know. <laughs> and. I say to the wife, as angry as she is, would you like it if your husband would read the word to you? And all the years we've been doing this, I've never had a woman say, no, I don't want my husband to read the Bible to me. It's instinctive. They want to hear their husbands transmit that word into them. And so that's what we have to do. We have to transmit, and the woman has to receive, because when we transmit our seed into the female, her body knows what to do with that. She doesn't have to say, okay, I'm in the first trimester. What do I got to do now? And then in the second trimester. No, she doesn't have. The body knows what to do. If you plant a seed into the soil, God, God created the soil to know exactly what to do. The soil knows what to do. We don't have to be concerned with that. So what you do is you transmit the word of God into your wife. And we do that every night before we go to bed. When I turn out the lights, I grab my phone, and I, I have you version on my phone, and I, I go to where we left off, and I read a chapter or two. I make sure she reads, because I know the next morning when we go into intercessory prayer, we really read the word. And, and ladies, be patient with your husbands. Allow them <laughs> yeah. to grow into this. They don't know, you know, maybe a lot of you men weren't raised by a father. So it's important that we ladies understand that our husbands may not know how to do this. So be patient with them. Love them through this and allow them to grow into this position. 
Because, gentlemen, you're going to find that your best ally on this planet is your wife. And the more you put the word into her, amen, the more you put the word into her, the more your prayers are going to be answered, the stronger you're going to be. The more effective you're going to be in your life, in your ministry, whatever. Well, time's kind of slipping away from us, so we're going to start with temperaments. All righty. Well, I'm going to start with the melancholy, and um, we're just going to just do a basic uh, run over with them. But first of all, I want to tell you, please don't try to self-diagnose. Right. <laughs> right. Okay. And so that can be um, dangerous. Right. It can be very dangerous. So some of these things, like he said earlier, we uh, the the temperament is in three different areas. So it's very, it's really rare when a person is the same temperament all the way through. So um, just when we're going through this, just keep in mind that you could be like a melancholy in one area, a cleric in another, or a supine in another. So just keep that in mind. We're going to have to pick up a little bit because okay, we got so 16 minutes. Melancholy are known for great think. They're being great thinkers. Um, it is important that. Um, you know, that you realize that uh, they're task-oriented and that type of thing. So I'm just going to skip on. Uh, you go ahead and do the next one here. Well, and, and melancholies are very deep thinkers. Mm -hmm. They have minds that won't shut off. And more genius-prone people are melancholies in inclusion than any other temperament. Yeah. They're, they're, they're sheer geniuses, and more million-dollar ideas are in the minds of melancholies than any other temperament. But... They have a mind that won't shut off. Mm -hmm. And because of that, when they try to put their head on their pillow at night and they can't sleep, what happens? The movie starts playing, right? Like a 3D movie and all the bad thing that's ever happened to you, you have to watch it all night long. There is a way out of that. Yes. There really is. And the sanguine is, is, uh, is, is next. Sanguines are lovers. We have a lot of sanguine in us. And actually, I'm a compulsive sanguine in affection, so I know sanguine. Because I've, li I've lived like this for a long time. Sanguines are lovers uh, and all the five temperaments. We have a genuine need to be around people. Whereas a melancholy will be stressed if they have to be around people. Right. We are stressed if we're not around people. Mm -hmm. So m sanguines, we have to be around people. We're great lovers. We need a great quantity of love. We need to be around great quantities of people. And if you're not around people on a daily basis, stress comes, depression happens. Now, we think best when we're around other people. When we see people moving, when we hear people talking, that's where we work best. On the other end of the scale, the melancholy, they need to be alone with the door shut, phone turned off. We always know when we call a melancholy, we don't expect an answer, and we don't expect them to return a text. Yep. <laughs> for at least a day or two, sometimes never. But we don't get angry because we know melancholy stress out when they talk to other people. And so I just know if I call, if I text brother or sister so and so and I don't get an answer, I know they're melancholy and I just, I don't expect it and it's not that big a deal. See, when you understand what your mate's temperament is, what used to bother you doesn't bother you anymore. That makes all the difference in the world. So we think best when we're around other people. Sanguines, we describe interaction with other people as the air that we breathe. If we're not around people, we're in trouble. So opening up a practice and seeing people all day long is just what the doctor ordered. So, but sanguines have what we call sanguine swings. We swing up into our independent mode, and a minute later, we could swing down into the dependent mode. And all of this depends on how your temperament needs are getting met. Because melancholies have temperament needs, sanguines have temperament needs, and the list goes on. So the next one that we want to touch on real quick, so sanguines are real people persons. Melancholies are task-oriented. If they have to be around people, they will, but they don't like it. So their best work is done when they can be alone. Sanguines, our best work is done when we are around other people. Now remember, there are three areas that we, with, that we profile. Inclusion, that's where your social orientation and intellectual energies lie. The, the next area is control, who's in control of a relationship and who's not. And the last is affection. 
And I always say the affection is the most important of the three areas to uh, a married couple because the Achilles heel of any married relationship is in the affection area. It's rarely in the inclusion, rarely in the control. It's in the affection area. So the next one is the choleric. And this is where, th this is my area of expertise because I am a compulsive choleric. That means I'm way over the top choleric. Compulsion isn't bad in this area. So. No, not the way we use it. It's just more of the good stuff. <clears throat> but if you're a choleric, you know who you are and what you are, and you don't need anybody to tell you because you already know. You knew when you were a child, you were a great leader. You always wanted to be the leader. You always wanted to be on top. And if you're not on top, if you're not leading, that's stressful for you. So being where I'm at, I have to be. I got fired from so many jobs because I'd look at the boss and I'd say, you know, you're an idiot. <laughs> I've done that more than once, and it's like, you're out. <laughs> and so <laughs> then God fixed me. He said, son, you can't do that to people. You can't use your gift like so that. So we had to work ourselves so we could have money coming in. Right. We did it, but, uh, well, because of God's grace. <laughs> It wasn't because of anything I did. So whatever your temperament is, whatever your gift is, tender it with love. That love makes it, it, it completes it. and makes it the gift that God has for you. So we're tough-willed. We rarely change our mind because we know that we're right. And we can prove it to anybody, any place, anytime, anywhere. And if people don't, don't believe it, then they're wrong. And we're not. Well, that's, that's the raw temperament. That's not the temperament of a choleric who's allowed the Holy Spirit to sanctify him, to, for the Word of God to work in him. When, when we come out, when we cholerics come out the other side, we look at people and we say, oh, how can I bless this person? How can I use my gift to make this person the best person that they can be? How can I lead them? And that, that, that's when it gets fun, when you're a choleric. So, some temperaments look for cholerics to follow. Whenever I see a male that's a choleric in control, I usually see a wife that's a supine in control. That's usually the way it is. Because supines, and I'll, I'm not going to steal your, your thunder here, but supines look for cholerics to lead them and guide them. And that, that's what we do best. So, if, if you have a pastor that is... If you have a pastor that is a good leader, like your pastor Winfield is, amen? He was a leader before time began. God wove him as a leader before his mama and daddy ever got together. Praise God. So, the phlegmatic. Now, the phlegmatic temperament is God's blending temperament. So, in our inclusionary, we're phlegmatic sanguines. And so the phlegmatic is God's blending temperament. If you're making a big pot of gumbo and you go to taste it and it's too spicy, what do you do? You grab some water, you pour it in, you stir the pot, and you keep tasting it until you get it to the consistency and the flavor that you want. That's what God does with the phlegmatic. So we're not full sanguines in inclusion. We're blended sanguines in inclusion. So that's what the phlegmatic temperament is. It has low energy level. Phlegmatics are great negotiators. They can bring peace to two warring factions simply because they just don't have the energy to fight it out, and they've learned over the years how to get people together. They do. So if you have a phlegmatic on your staff, that person is going to be the best negotiator that you got. So the last one is? The last one is the supine, and I am a supine in my control area. And the supine is the fifth temperament that many people don't know about. And the National Christian Counselors Association is the only one that's allowed to use Correct. this particular um, temperament. Many people were falling through the cracks. So praise God, uh, Dr. Phyllis uh, Arno, she went to begin praying and speaking, you know, asking God what, what this fifth temperament was, and he gave it to her. And I'm so glad he Amen. did because I would have fallen through the cracks, so as many people would. Um, the supine is known as a servant. We're wired to serve. So probably a lot of the volunteers 
in this church, you know, have some supine somewhere in their temperament. Not always, but a lot of times. So um, for servants, um, the supine interacts with people like uh, no other temperament um, and can connect, so on and so forth. Uh, we're very non-invasive. Uh, you know, sometimes when people come in, uh, when Doc and I are both accepting uh, patients at the time, we'll say, well, you know, and a couple doesn't know which one they really want, then Doc will come in and he'll say, well, if you want a non-invasive, <laughs> pick her. Um, but a lot of times they'll say, no, I need it right to the point, and that's okay. So, um, but the non-invasive way, uh, we reach people in ways that uh, no other temperament can. Uh, the supine needs people, uh, and because of the fact that supines do not like to make decisions, um, so thank God he gave me a husband that's choleric that will help make those decisions for me. Now, I'm not like a regular supine because of learned behavior. When I was younger, um, we, I was out at nine years old, 100 miles away from home, directing Bible schools uh, and teaching. So uh, I kind of learned, by learned behavior, how to be a leader. Uh, but I don't suggest that for everybody that's a supine. No. Um, moving along really quickly, um, uh, the fear of rejection is very real uh, in, in all the temperaments. Sorry. In Sorry. all the temperaments, but um, in the supine, when they are rejected, it's much like death. It's, it's very deep, it's very hurtful, um, and so uh, I'm going to stop it there because our time is up and we need to do some Just shooting. about, but I wanted to add something to the supine temperament that we need to learn to communicate with our mates and just people in general, family, children, based on temperament. And things that I could say to somebody else that they would just kind of laugh and we kind of laugh and have fun with it. If I say it to my supine wife, she takes it as, a, as rejection. And that rejection can go very, very deep. And so learning to communicate with your mate via knowing what your temperament is, is what we're all about. Pastor, are you ready? Was this good or what? Now, now I'm sitting over there saying, oh my gosh, oh my gosh, I can't wait to get up. I can't wait to get up because I am a choleric. And so... There he is. <laughs> And we found that out when we had our session. Yes, we but did. But what, what I wanted to do is, how many of y'all have some questions in here? Anybody have any questions in here? Now listen, let's, what, I, what I want you to do is, I want you to think about, about everything that they just said. And I'm gonna ask them a couple of questions just so that we can get clarity so that I want you, I want you to know exactly how powerful uh, knowing this information is. So, so, uh, Doc, you guys talked about about the different uh, the different sections uh, of inclusion, control, and affection. All right. Yeah. That can you can you go back and just kind of hit those those three different sections? Sure. That you don't necessarily have to be one temperament in those sections. That you can be two, a different. Blend. A blend of those. Sure. Two. Can you talk about that? Well, the blend is always the phlegmatic, like mm -hmm. wh whichever it is, melancholy, phlegmatic. Now, inclusion, control, and affection. Man is a spirit, we live in a body, and we have a soul. Mm. Now what is the soul comprised of? Mind, Mind will, will, and emotion. Mm -hmm. Inclusion, control, and affection is, is, is just another name.